the International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast, Earthly Powers, Part 3, The Pope and the Devil. Earthly Powers is Anthony Burgess's longest and most accomplished novel. It was first published in 1980, and the International Anthony Burgess Foundation is releasing a series of podcasts to mark its 40th anniversary. In part one of our Earthly Powers podcast, we explored the character of Kenneth Toomey, but there is one other character who looms large in the novel, Carlo Campanati the corpulent and unorthodox priest with whom Toomey's life is entwined. In this episode, we ask the question, is Carlo in league with the devil? According to Burgess, earthly powers began life as a fictionalised retelling of the life of Pope John XXIII, who was pontiff from 1958 to 1963. In the writing of the novel, Pope John XXIII mutated into Carlo Campanati, but many parallels exist between the two men. Carlo's physical description, his homely features and bulk, fits with pictures of Pope John XXIII, as do his papal dates and his intention to reform the Catholic Church. Pope John XXIII instigated the Second Vatican Council in 1962, an act which was intended to reform the Catholic Church's relationship with the modern world. One of the most radical changes proposed by Pope John was the changing of the Mass from Latin to vernacular languages. Though at this point, Burgess described himself as a lapsed Catholic, he was particularly aggrieved by this development, believing that removing tradition from the Mass was somehow belittling the ritual. In a 1979 letter to his friend Geoffrey Agler, He went so far as to describe Pope John as an emissary of the devil. He attempts to explain his thinking in a 1967 article titled On Being a Lapsed Catholic. I find that I have no quarrel with any aspect of the whole corpus of Catholic doctrine. Granted the ignition spark of faith, all the tenets of the Church would hold for me. Indeed, I tend to be puristic about these, even uneasy about what I consider to be dangerous tendencies to slackness, cheapness, ecumenical dilutions. Burgess's attitude about the modernisation of the church is further revealed when he describes going to watch his cousin, George Dwyer, being installed as the Archbishop of Birmingham. He remembers the scene in an interview in 1978. When my cousin was elevated, or whatever the term is, as Archbishop, I went to his Mass in Birmingham. This was the first Reformed Mass I'd seen. I was horrified. I was horrified by the turning of the altar around for a start. It was like a butcher's shop. The man was preparing some meat. There were laymen participating, and there was the kiss of peace. Once you can allow this, once you can allow your priest to go around in flamboyant neckties... That's the end. John XXIII's unorthodox desire to reform the rituals of the church was Burgess's initial inspiration, but he went on to build Carlo's character from a patchwork of religious philosophy and literary ideas. Carlo's attitude to life is surprisingly secular for a priest, and he indulges in behaviour that is considered sinful by the doctrines of the church. Carlo is gluttonous, materialistic and hubristic, prone to anger, but also prone to sleeping during daylight hours, and, it is revealed towards the end of the novel, lustful towards Toomey's sister. It is clear that Burgess is using the framework of the seven deadly sins to build Carlo's character, something which he had done before in the creation of his spy character in Tremor of Intent. When Toomey first meets Carlo, He witnesses the priest's large appetite and considers the conflict between his behaviour and the teachings of the church. 
I wondered whether to raise the theological issue of gluttony, but I knew what the answer would be. Eating your fill was not gluttony, it was good, nay, a necessity. As for eating beyond your fill, that was the devil's work, and it contrived a kind of purgation along with temporary agony, both salutary things. It's clear from this reaction that Carlo's relationship with the seven deadly sins is a complicated one. The physical punishment gluttony brings, according to Carlo, is enough for the glutton to remain free of sin. Though Carlo appears to be guilty of all the seven deadly sins at some point in the novel, he is more concerned with a different category of sin altogether. His manifesto shows a desire to reform the Catholic Church away from the idea of original sin and towards the idea that man is made in God's image and inherently good. He explains this in his sermon early in the novel. Man was made by God in his own image. God made man without flaw, but also free to become flawed. Yet the flaws are reversible. The return to perfection is possible if we call ourselves sometimes with great justice miserable sinners, we must remember that we have willed ourselves to be so, that this is not the state which the divine creator has imposed on us, that this is the working of free will. But that free will which enables us to sin is the most glorious gift of the heavenly father. We must learn to join our will to his, and not to that of the adversary. This, in a word, the meaning of our human life. Carlo's sermon reveals him to follow the Pelagian mode of thought. Pelagius was a 5th century monk who believed that Adam's sin of eating the apple did not taint the whole of mankind, and that free will was more important than divine grace in the pursuit of goodness. This directly contradicted the teachings of Augustine, who believed that man was born into a state of original sin and could only achieve goodness through the grace of God. Augustine believed the Pelagian philosophy to be a heresy and denounced it. In basing Carlo's manifesto for reform on a perceived heresy, Burgess is hinting that his motivations may not be benign. His motivations are made even clearer when he gives Toomey his manifesto for the reformation of the church. Toomey sees it as a dangerous document, and Carlo himself describes it in destructive terms, contrary to the more conservative views of the church. Religion is the most dangerous thing in the world. It is not little girls in their communion frocks and silly holy pictures and the children of Mary. It is high explosive. Dynamite, the splitting of the atom. The title of the novel indicates that Carlo is willing to gamble his heavenly rewards in order to gain the earthly powers of being the leader of the church. Yet this was not Burgess's original title for the novel. At some point during its composition, he considered the Instruments of Darkness, taken from Shakespeare's Macbeth, a play about the curse of ambition and the lengths a man will go to achieve power. When the manuscript was completed, he settled on the title The Prince of the Power of the Air, taken from Hobbes's Leviathan, a more overt reference to the demonic influences on Carlo. After his arrest by the Nazis, Toomey remembers reading Leviathan and quotes a particularly potent paragraph. A confederacy of deceivers, that to obtain dominion over men in this present world, endeavour by dark and erroneous doctrines to extinguish in them the light, both by nature and of the gospel, and so to disprepare them for the kingdom of God to come. This appears to sum up Carlo's diabolical motivation. Yet Burgess's depiction of the satanic influence on Carlo is complicated by the fact that the reader only ever sees him through Toomey's eyes. 
despite the prince of the power of the air referring to Satan. In an article written on the publication of Earthly Powers, Burgess claims it is an ambiguous title. The air is full of angels and their prince is good. The air is full of devils and their prince is evil. The novel is about the difficulty of deciding what is good and what is evil. And this decision is put to Toomey. But the subtlety of earthly powers lies in the fact that it is Toomey himself as the first person narrator who constructs Carlo's character, and he adds small subjective details that build to create a demonic image. For example, when Toomey first witnesses Carlo at the gambling tables, he is described as having the devil's luck, and when Toomey is considering Carlo's parentage, he uses very telling language. Carlo was physically gross compared with that paired and elegant family. In a flash, I saw him as a changeling, a goblin baby dumped in a campanati pram. He was certainly unlike his brother, Raffaele. Despite being recruited to help prove Carlo's suitability for sainthood, Toomey's descriptions go some way to prove otherwise. It is possible his miracle, one of the tests that can be applied for sainthood, could be in the service of evil, and Toomey's description of his funeral indicates that Carlo is unsuitable for beatification. In Catholic doctrine, the incorruptibility of the mortal remains of the pious is one of the tests that can be applied for sainthood. But Toomey describes the demonic fate of Carlo's body. Despite hidden electric fans, the air was foul about Carlo's body. He had left instructions not to embalm. Here was the corruptible that had to be put off. The face had turned the colour of strong tea. The ears were black. The mouth gaped idiotically, showing teeth still strong. But perhaps Toomey's most obvious hint that Carlo is in league with the devil comes at the conclave during which he is not elected Pope. Toomey strongly suggests that Carlo has placed a hex on the new Pope, which causes him to drop dead as soon as he is elected. It was on the third day that the event occurred which bred much fanciful speculation of a horrific kind and even inspired a detective story called Murder in the Conclave. In the early afternoon, the ballot recorded 91 votes for Caserati. There were murmurs of Deo Gratius, and then the venerable patriarch rose from his seat, thrust out an arm, and cried, No, no, and then collapsed onto the fawn wall carpet. Prayers were said, and the ballot was resumed. Its result was definitive, Carlo Campanati gained his own votes, as well as most of those of the dead patriarch. It was a walkover. These small details add up in Toomey's narrative, but it's also relevant that he sees the world through his obsession with literature. His biography is always adjacent to canonical works, and he uses literature to add colour to the story of his life. His first sexual experience, for example, being in Dublin on the day of Leopold Bloom's Odyssey in Joyce's Ulysses. It is apparent that Toomey's view of Carlo is influenced by different versions of the story of Faust. In this story, Faust makes a bargain with the devil. In exchange for his eternal damnation in the afterlife, he will have knowledge, power and pleasure on earth. Burgess wrote his undergraduate thesis on Christopher Marlowe's version of the story, and it appears that it influenced him throughout his career. But there is also evidence of the influence of both the Goethe and Thomas Mann versions of the story in Earthly Powers. Thomas Mann's Dr Faustus 
tells the story of a composer who sells his soul to the devil in exchange for 24 years of creative genius. But what's notable about Mann's version of the story is that it's also the story of Germany in the first half of the 20th century. Just as earthly powers is used to comment on the social and political conflict of good and evil in the 20th century, Mann's Dr Faustus examines the rise of the Nazi party through the context of a wager with Satan. For Burgess, this must have been particularly potent, as the story of Dr Faustus is tied up with his own experiences of the Nazi war machine, as he explains in the author's note of A Dead Man in Deptford. In Moss Side, in the small hours, I sat, my induction into the British Army deferred, typing my university thesis on Christopher Marlowe. The visions of hell in Dr. Faustus seem not too irrelevant. I'll burn my books. Ah, Mephistopheles. The Luftwaffe was to burn my books, and even my thesis. Mephistopheles, as Thomas Mann was to show in his own Dr. Faustus, was no mere playhouse bogeyman. While Mann's Faustus gives us some insight into the thematic structure of earthly powers, it is perhaps Goethe's Faust that reveals the plight of Carlo. Goethe's version of the story follows the traditional plot, though significantly it's not Faust who instigates the wager with the devil, but the devil himself who seduces Faust. It is also the only version of the story in which Faust is saved at the end and goes to heaven, why is this relevant to Carlo's story? Burgess offers hints that Goethe's Faust is the key to understanding Carlo when we hear of his deathbed confession to Hortense. He said that he loved her, but only as Dante loved Beatrice. She to him personified the divine vision made flesh. As for the flesh, he added that if they'd been able to meet early enough, he would never have taken orders, but would have asked her to marry him. When Toomey tells this confession to the Archbishop of Malta, he replies, Eternal woman draws us upward, which is the saving grace from Goethe's Faust, in which Faust is saved from damnation by his love Gretchen. In Earthly Powers, it seems Carlo hopes Hortense can provide similar salvation for him, and is the clearest indication that he might have made the devil's bargain. But the novel allows us to interpret this in more than one way. Is Carlo sincere in his repentance? Does he truly accept divine grace at the end of his life? All we know is that Toomey did not witness Carlo's death, so he, and we, cannot be sure exactly what has happened. Carlo Campanati is one of Burgess's most complex and well-drawn characters. It is too simple to say with certainty that he has made the bargain with the devil. His desire to reform the church still lies within the bounds of religious philosophy, and the winnings from his frequent gambling are used for charitable purposes. It is Toomey, through his own confused relationship with religion, who creates the possibility of the satanic influences on Carlo's character. And Carlo can be seen in the lineage of Burgess's characters, like Alex in A Clockwork Orange, who are created from their author's fascination with the limits of human goodness and the possibility of evil when it comes to free will. You have been listening to the Earthly Powers podcast, written and narrated by Graham Foster. Readings were by Paul Barnhill. The music was by Anthony Burgess. For more information about Earthly Powers and Anthony Burgess, visit www.anthonyburgess.org.